this time, I would love to welcome to the stage District Attorney Jack Whalen. District Attorney Whalen has been at the forefront of this issue. He has created and is the chair of the Opioid Task Force in Delaware County. Uh, for many years, he has been promoting this issue as have our legislators. Um, and I would like to welcome him at this time to discuss the different topics that he has seen here in Delaware County. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. It's certainly a pleasure to be back here at Newman University. I appreciate the invitation and certainly the topic matter. As many of you know, you know, the role of the district attorney, the chief role, of course, being the head of law enforcement throughout Delaware County, is the prosecution of cases. And in our office, we are prosecuting between nine and 10,000 felony and misdemeanor cases each year, which doesn't include the juvenile cases, which in many years run from three to 4,000 cases per year. And it doesn't include all of the traffic citations and summary appeals that are handled in summary appeal court. So you can imagine that our office is quite busy handling all of these cases and the prosecution of those cases, making sure that justice is rendered in a fair and efficient manner. However, the role of the district attorney has changed over the years. It probably changed first after 9-11, the district attorney's office throughout this country have taken a more active role in dealing with issues of protection and prevention. And that has been the goal here in Delaware County over the last few years, is we're looking not only at the prosecution of cases, certainly that is our, our key role, but we're looking at preventive and proactive means how to prevent people from becoming victims of crime, how to reduce violence. Many of you know that we have a major campaign going on right now, which we're calling an anti-violence, anti-illegal gun campaign that we've launched and with focus on certain areas of the county, including the city of Chester. And that takes up a considerable amount of my time. And the other issue, of course, that takes up a considerable amount of time is dealing with the opioid epidemic here in Delaware County. And if many of you heard me speak in the past, you've heard me comment that this came about because of our aggressive law enforcement efforts. We were out a couple of years back on a raid and we have a uh, task force here in Delaware County. We call it the Narcotics Task Force, not to be confused with the Heroin Task Force. And the Narcotics Task Force is about 60 law enforcement officers, and we call them, they're assigned to the Drug Task Force. And they work, not only in their own community, they work throughout Delaware County in neighboring municipalities. And they are working constantly to try to bring the law enforcement aspect under control with dealing with sellers of uh, illegal drugs and heroin dealers. And we take a very aggressive stance against those type of dealers because we think it's equally important to be prosecuting these cases and that the people that are polluting our children, the people that are selling these dangerous drugs are brought to justice. But one of the problems we ran into on that end, and I wanted to comment on that because it came up relatively recently, is a court decision came out about a year ago where minimum mandatory sentencing in drug cases was thrown out. And we're lucky today, we have Senator Tom Killian and we have our state representatives that we work with on a daily basis. And a lot of the state representatives, and I won't mention names here today, but a lot of our state representatives passed in the House to reinstate minimum mandatory sentencing dealing with uh, drug dealers. It also deals with part of that minimum mandatory sentencing is if you commit a crime with a firearm, you go in and you rob a store and you put a gun to the clerk's head, we in the district attorney's office have the option to pursue minimum mandatory sentencing and before it was rendered unconstitution, unconstitutional, the person received five to ten years. Now we could take it out of the minimum mandatory, but most of those cases we did not unless there were special circumstances because of the nature and the violent behavior and the dangerousness 
of those type of criminals. Similarly, with drugs, sellers of drugs were facing minimum mandatory sentencing. We had the ability to take it out if we so chose, but we went after dangerous drug dealers and the courts had to impose certain sentences based on minimum mandatory sentencing. Well, that, we don't have that anymore today because of the court decision, but there is pending legislation that passed the House that's now with the Senate in order to uh, pass minimum mandatory sentencing again and have drug dealers serve more time. Right now, in Pennsylvania, they use sentencing guidelines, and they're much less than a minimum mandatory. And under sentencing guidelines, for example, a person may only get six months instead of two years because the judges will follow sentencing guidelines, and some of our office personnel will be instructed to sentence in accordance, of course, with the sentencing guidelines. However, I am talking with our staff, and our staff are now being instructed that they were going to plea the case to open, which means that we're going to be arguing for sentences for heroin dealers, and we're limiting this to heroin dealers, that heroin dealers, we are going to now ask the court to sentence much more stringently, much more significantly, because we believe that it's the heroin dealers that we have to also address in this opioid and heroin epidemic that's facing not only Delaware County and Pennsylvania, but is sweeping across the country. So what you're gonna see is our office, notwithstanding the fact that we don't have minimum mandatory sentencing, and notwithstanding the fact that the guidelines may call for a lighter sentence to be arguing in heroin cases for a much more significant sentence. Now, the importance of that is the fact that so many individuals feel that it's profitable for them to be selling drugs and that they're making significant money by selling, bringing in heroin, cutting it with certain agents, and then selling it on the streets. And what we know is that a lot of the young individuals, the teenagers, the young adults, and even some middle-aged individuals that we come across, they are becoming severely addicted they can't control their addiction, and of course, they're gonna do whatever they can to buy these drugs from these dealers. But of course, it's the work of the Narcotics Task Force to enforce the law as it relates to it. However, it's the Heroin Task Force that was created back in 2012 because we knew that we had to do more than just deal with the law enforcement end of it. And that's when the heroin task force was created. It was created as a result of a drug raid out of Collingdale where we saw that this community was being devastated with heroin dealers, with people that were addicted, and with people that were being arrested and prosecuted. So we created the task force so that we could address prevention, education, and awareness. And that, of course, has developed now to treatment and recovery. Councilman White is with us today, and he is going to address the issues and accomplishments of the Heroin Task Force. And those issues and accomplishments are significant that he will explain to you. However, on many occasions when I get the opportunity to speak, I don't have the ability on the focus issues to deal with the law enforcement end of it. And I see a number of our law enforcement partners here with us today. So I wanted to re-emphasize the commitment of the district attorney's office that to make sure that on the law enforcement end, we are going to aggressively pursue those type of issues as well as continuing to work with the heroin task force to deal with the issues of prevention, education, awareness, and now in treatment and recovery. I think it's important also to recognize the fact that as these statistics continue to increase, we are remaining optimistic that through the efforts of education in our schools, I believe that if we have the opportunity to address it with the students, and we use NOPE and, and Dave will talk about that, but if we continue to address it with the schools, address it with the parents, the children will recognize the fact of how dangerous heroin, fentanyl, and even opioid medication has become. And I think 
there is a direct link, a direct correlation that no one will dispute, that back in the 70s, you did not have the direct correlation between heroin use and prescription medication. But what has happened in the 80s, 90s, and in the 2000s with doctors and with the advent of much more pain medication becoming available and being heavily relied upon by many Americans, they have now developed the addiction problem as a result of the prescriptions that they have been taking. And now when they cannot have the access to prescription medication, heroin is a cheap alternative for them and it simulates the effect that is present when they take opioid medication. So that is why we're seeing the problems we're seeing today as a result of the addiction to prescription medication and then ultimately leading to heroin. It's unclear as to why we're seeing so many you know, molecular, uh, I guess the, the ability where the drug is being simulated um, and then changed to, for example, to carfentanil. Um, that, again, these are synthetic drugs that are made in the laboratories. And so when they change the molecular structure, the ingredients of these to make them more powerful, it's even more concerning. We had a recent meeting where we're worried about law enforcement, our heroin task force, um, the individuals that will go out and deal, the police officers, for example. The problem is that they come in contact with some of these very powerful drugs. If they get it on their hands or on their clothing, they can experience an overdose themselves. So now, members of the narcotics task force are actually carrying uh, naloxone, nasal Narcan on them, so if they were to experience the effects of an overdose themselves, that they have the drug available that they're using in patrol vehicles that Dave will talk about uh, as one of the accomplishments of the heroin task force. We're very proud of the accomplishments because it took many years and we lead the state of Pennsylvania, Delaware County leads the state in, its in, it, in the accomplishments of all police departments carrying nasal Narcan, as well as our educational efforts and our efforts to now go and collect um, the unused prescription medications. And Dave will also announce a new plan that we have uh, to have a mobile unit come forward where we didn't have it available uh, in the past. So I'm going to wrap up and save um, the remaining issues to address if you have any specific questions on some of the topics that I covered. And I'm going to defer back to Danielle to come up and introduce the next speaker. But I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and I look forward to answering any questions that you have in regard to any of the topics I talked about today as well as anything that may be of concern to you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, District Attorney Whalen. Um, as you can hear, this is a major issue for uh, the, the District Attorney's Office for Delaware County and for our legislature. Um, I'm going to now introduce to you uh, Senator Tom Killian, who is at the forefront of this issue for the Senate, working to pass legislation involving the opioid crisis. A previous member of the House of Representatives and service to Delaware County, Senator Killian will be providing us an update on the legisla legislation that's currently pending and what he's working to do to help us with this issue. Thanks so much. Thank you, Danielle. It's always great to follow our DA, Jack Whalen. And I, I got to start by saying, you know, there's 67 counties in Pennsylvania, and I deal with all the senators, and I've only been a Senate for a year in the House for 13 years. Um, they're all looking at Delaware County. Uh, Delaware County did it right. Uh, folks like Jack Whalen and Dave White and the other four members of Delaware County saw this early on uh, for the Delaware County Ter Heroin Task Force, which I'm very, very pleased to be part of. And the only other person in the Commonwealth that caught on early on was Senator Gene Yaw, because he was seeing this in rural areas. Uh, and he's been a leader on this issue in the Senate. I often 
follow Gene's, uh, Gene's lead. Uh, we've been very active in Harrisburg um, uh, addressing this issue, really pro trying to, one, provide tools for education, but also tools to give law enforcement and folks like Jack Dowd so that they can prosecute uh, folks that um, uh, peddle these drugs to, 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 vote to people. Um, and so I'd like to just run through some of the bills that we passed, and then more, maybe even more importantly, some of the bills that uh, we're looking to do, we're currently working on. Uh, first of all, Jack mentioned Narcan. That was legislation we passed to allow police and emergency responders, and now even family members have Narcan. We passed the Good Samaritan Law, which says it allows the children or kids or if someone's addicted to drugs or having a, uh, an overdose and, and they call the police, uh, they will not be prosecuted. Uh, there were incidents, incidents where uh, someone was overdosing and they panicked and they didn't call and a life was lost. Uh, I introduced, I was a prime sponsor, and introduced Senate Bill 1368, now signed by the governor, to implement the safe opioid prescription curriculum in Pennsylvania's medical schools in an effort to stem this problem. The, uh, this act calls for folks in five key areas, including pain management, multimodal treatment for chronic pain that minimizes the use of controlled substances containing op opioid, instruction on safe methods of prescribing controlled substance, identification of patients who have been identified as at risk for developing problems with prescription opioids, and teaching medical students how to manage substance abuse and, and diseases of chron and chronic disease orders. Uh, and that goes back to what Jack said. Uh, like he said, in the 70s, there wasn't a direct connection. More and more, we see that most of the folks addicted now to heroin are addicted to heroin because they were looking for a cheaper alternative to, to the prescription drug they first came addicted to. Uh, Representative Brown passed Act 22. This regulates prescri prescribing controlled substances in hospitals, emergency rooms, and urgent care centers. They may not prescribe opioids in cut quantities that last more than seven days, and they cannot write refills. Uh, John Marr, Representative Marr, passed Act, Act 123, which allows federal, state, and local law enforcement entities, hospitals, assisted living facilities, home health care agencies, long-term care nursing facilities, hospice, and commonwealth licensed pharmacies to service drop-off locations for any extra unwanted or expired prescription drugs or over-the-county pharmaceutical products. Another area where Delaware County was way ahead of the curve. Uh, Senator Gene Yaw, who I mentioned earlier, amended the Achieving Better Care by monitoring all prescriptions programs that require continuing education, pain management, addiction, and dispensing for prescribers. We also now, in the Department of Health, require all opiates, it's just about to be up and running, all the opiates pres prescribed to be entered into a central database so the Department of Health can see where we may be having some issues. Act 125 addressed the increasing risk of children becoming addicted to opioids and heroin after being prescribed painkillers for medical procedures. This act will require all prescribers to receive written consent from the minor's parent or legal guardian in order to prescribe medical treatment containing opioids, as well as to discuss the risk of addiction and dangers of over overdose associated with those medications. I'm also co-sponsor of several other bills that we're currently working on. Senate Bill 419, another Gene Yaw bill, Senator Gene Yaw, requires county coroners and or medical examiners in the state to report in writing to the Department of Health the death of a person resulting from a drug overdose, given the time and place of death and related circumstances. Uh, Gene Yaw is another bill, uh, Senate Bill 472, which would limit the prescription of controlled substance containing an op op opioid to, a, to seven days unless there's a medical emergency that puts the patient's health or safety at risk. This is out of committee and I voted in favor on, that, in favor of the, on the Consumer Protection Committee. Senator Gino has another bill requiring mandatory implementation of opioid prescription guidelines developed by the Safe Effective Pre Prescribing Practice Task Force. This also came out of the Health, health and Human Services Committee. Senate Bill uh, 662 by Senator Bartolotta amends Title 18 to establish a second, second degree felony for the di distribution of an illicit drug that results in serious bodily injury to the user. This is an issue that, that our DA was interested in before the, the heavier penalties only came with the death. Well, now if we have to administer Narcan, that could be enough to have, go, implement more serious penalties. Another tool for our DA. And lastly, the one we're working on is the e-prescribing of opioid medication. And this is by Senator Alloway. Authorized electronic prescribing of opioid medications as a, solely as the only way to provide it, as a means to prevent diversion used in handwritten prescriptions. 
Right now, we go back Monday, we go back Monday this is budget time, uh, and we have a very, very difficult budget. Uh, we put $15 million in last year's budget that was used to open up the Centers for Excellence, uh, but we all are committed, even as tough as this budget is, to put more money in the budget this year to help address this, uh, this issue. Jack mentioned that the DA's office has moved on to treatment and, and, and uh, helping folks get better. Uh, that, well, that's the next thing we're going to look at. What can we do to provide more funding for this and also to work with insurance companies to see that they extend the period of time that folks are uh, uh, being detoxed because the current rules where they're in and out in 30 days just isn't, isn't enough. Oh, there's one other bill I forgot that's going to be introduced uh, by Senator McGarrigal from Springfield uh, the, and, uh, that will require the licensing of these, uh, the recovery homes. We have very good ones and I see my, one of my good friends in the audience from MVP who runs a fantastic one. But we have some folks who are actually praying on folks through this, what's, with what's going on. They're literally opening flop houses and having people come there thinking they're going to a, uh, a long-term treatment center. They're just to make money and they're really going to a flop house where there's more drugs than where they came from. Tomsville will put an end to that. So as you can see, we're very, very, very busy, but we have a long, long way to go with this problem. It is not gonna be solved overnight. Uh, it starts with educating, educating our young children in, in grade school about that prescription drugs, just because they're prescribed, doesn't mean they're safe. Uh, working with their docs to understand that over-prescription over of opioids leads to uh, drug addiction and heroin addiction. Uh, but we all need to work together as a community. And it's been a pleasure for me as a state senator, one, it's actually an honor to have folks come up to me and say, tell us how you're doing that in Delaware County. We keep hearing about all the great programs. And it's been fantastic to work with, with Jack and, and uh, oh my God, <laughs> Dave Wolf. <laughs> One of my best friends. Uh, but pl thank you for having me here, and uh, I really appreciate Newman University putting on this event. Thank you so much, Senator. Appreciate that. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and you continue to do to fight for this cause in Harrisburg for us. Thank you. I would next like to introduce Dave White, Councilman for Delaware County. Uh, as we've, we've talked about, Delaware County has been in the forefront and Dave White has been uh, one of the individuals since 2014 that's been serving a Delaware County Council specific to this issue. He's a member of the Heroin Task Force and has been part of the recent um, funding for the prevention and for the additional treatment facilities that we have in Delaware County for those that are suffering. So at this time, I have the pleasure of introducing Dave White. Uh, thank you, Danielle, I really do appreciate it. And I thank you all for being here today. Uh, and I thank you because this is, as Senator Killian and as District Attorney Jack Whalen stated, this is, I believe, the most consequential problem we have in uh, Delaware County right now. This is our future that we're talking about. And, and uh, as Jack said, we started the Heroin Task Force back in 2012 after his drug raids, and after we all realized exactly what was happening in our county. And to give you a couple statistics, back in 2012, we had 52 drug overdose deaths, 52. And that was a rise from uh, 2011. Just last year, we had 220 drug deaths in Delaware County. Right now, drug deaths account for more than vehicle accidents and homicides in the state of Pennsylvania. That's a staggering statistic, and it is growing. That's why we need each and every one of you to help out with this. And what we recognized when we started the Heroin Task Force in 2012 is that we do need everyone to be part of the solution. So we put together a great coalition of the, uh, the county uh, District Attorney Whalen was chairperson of that uh, heroin task force. We had Senator Killian on there. I see uh, Sheriff Hoppers here, who is a member of our heroin task force. But we also have a lot of people from our town. Uh, nonprofits are part of that task force. We have our people from Human Resources as part of that task force. Because we believe we had to get strong partnerships to be able to win this battle and this war on heroin. We partnered with a mother that started a, uh, an organization called NOTE, Narcotics, Overdose, Prevention, and Education. 
She started that, a very brave uh, woman, started that because she lost her daughter to the drug addiction fight. And what NOTE does, NOTE goes out to our elementary and high school students, and they give a no-nonsense, no holds no bar presentation to the students to explain exactly what this heroin, opioid, and fentanyl problem will do to you. That one pill can get you started on a road that is going to be incredibly difficult to come back from or a road you will not be able to come back from. During that presentation, they'll have posters, about 20 uh, posters, three by two posters, of all the young people that have died from heroin overdose. Even brothers, same house, same time, best friends, having a, just a pill or two, they think it's just one, that's all it is, and they never wake up. The parents come into their room and they find both of them just because it was a simple sleepover. 14 years old, I believe they were. That's the, that's the problem we are facing. We never knew we were facing that type of problem. We knew it was a big problem. We knew Delaware County, for one thing we were not gonna do is hide our heads in the sand and pretend that it was just gonna go away. So in 2012, as Jack Whalen stated, we started the heroin task force. As I said, we got partnerships, and we found out very early uh, that one thing that was happening, one way people were getting pills, whether to sell them or use them, was to go to open houses. While they were going through the open house, they were pretending to be couples going through the open house. While one person was walking through the house with the realtor, the other was going through the medicine cabinets of these open houses. And they're smart. They go through and they steal half the pills, put it back, nobody knows the difference. Now they just made 20 or $30 a pill because that's what the, open, the market was, uh, was uh, uh, it cost in the open market. And they were selling them. So we got a realtor education program started through the Heroin Task Force. We have a realtor named Ray McKinney that is part of that. And we got the realtors together and we made them get the word, or asked them to get the word out, if you will, to all the open houses that they had that you wouldn't leave your guns, you wouldn't leave your jewelry out for people to go through. Don't leave your medicines out. Lock them away or take them with you. As you know, in open houses, nobody's usually home. That's been an incredibly successful program started and initiated through the Heroin Task Force. Once we got it started, we also uh, realized what statistics is telling you is that children, young people, don't just start off at heroin. They start off with pills. And they usually start off, well, whether it's being prescribed those pills for an injury, whether it's sports injury, football, tennis, baseball in injury, or they're getting those pills, they're stealing those pills from their family, whether it's their a guardian, a mother, a father, from their medicine cabinets. So we instituted a program called the Medicine Dropbox. I hope you've all heard about it. It is a drop box, a very secure drop box that is now in every police department in Delaware County. It's in Riddle Hospital, it's in Crozier Hospital, and it's in the government center. There's about 50 of these boxes throughout the county in which you can bring your drugs, any drugs, any prescription, unused, not needed drugs, up to at any time during the day to a secure location because it's in a police department or right next to security in other areas, and you can drop your drugs in there. We don't have to wait for the once a year, the semi-annual drug collection. You can do it any day, any night. And one thing each and every one of you can do today to fight the battle of this drug uh, overdose uh, is to go to your homes, talk to your neighbors, talk to your relatives, clean out your medicine cabinets. You go home, you'll be amazed what's in there, how old the pills are. Take them to one of these drug uh, drop-off boxes and that will be a big part of what you can do just today to fight this drug addiction and win, help win this battle and this war on drug addiction. After drug uh, drop-off boxes, uh, District Attorney uh, and the uh, Chief Ryan, who was also here as a member of uh, the Heroin Task Force, they went to a seminar and learned about a drug, an amazing drug. I, I call it a miracle drug, naloxone. I think we've all pretty much heard what naloxone can do now. In the face of an overdose death, 
were coming on to overdose death, uh, one squirt of naloxone could reverse the overdose. The district attorney brought that back to Pennsylvania. And we did work with our state legislature. Tom Killian was a state legislator at, legislator at the time, our state senators. And we were able to pass a law, Davis Law, in Pennsylvania that would allow police officers to be able to administer naloxone. Now, that's a big deal because when you get a call that your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, one of your loved ones is in an overdose state, the first one normally on the scene is a police officer. At that time, prior to this law, they were not allowed to administer any drugs, including naloxone. They had to wait for the EMS uh, uh, people to get there. Often, that was too late. That was another five, six, seven minutes. It was too late. Allowing the this law to change and allowing the police officer to administer this life-saving drug, we have saved almost 700 lives since 2014. That's an amazing statistic. 700 people that very well may have been gone today are still alive. And that's a result of the hard work of our District Attorney Jack Whalen, working with the police uh, departments, the chiefs of every police department. And in, in Delaware County, I believe we were the first county that every police department, every police car had naloxone in their police car. And we, were, we made sure as Delaware County Council to supply that. We supplied the naloxone. Each police car had two, uh, two doses. And as they used them, we would replace them. That's a life changer, and that's a life saving item that the Heroin Task Force was able to do and accomplish. And an incredibly big part of that is because of our District Attorney, Jack Whalen. After uh, naloxone, we worked with a pharmacy that's up in Radnor. Naloxone, what you had to do, you had to take it apart, you had to put it together. It was about a three step, three stage, still very quick, an injection, and you could save a life. Then we worked with a pharmacy called Adapta Pharma. Adapta Pharma uh, developed a even a quicker do, way to administer naloxone. It's called Narcan. It's literally take it out of the box, squeeze it, in, uh, put it in the nose, squeeze it, and within three seconds, three seconds, the overdose is reversed in most cases. If they have to do it again, they can do it again. There are no major effects, side effects from naloxone. I know there are a lot of police officers, I was talking to a couple of them, that have done this multiple times. And they are the true heroes. They run in and in a cool, calm, and collective way are able to save these lives because they have this life-saving uh, drug. So I do thank each and every one of you for uh, being prepared for that. Now we got to a point, we're saving these lives. We had naloxone, we have Narcan, we knew we had to move to the next step. So in 2014, Delaware County initiated what we called our certi the Certified Recovery Specialist. It was two recovery specialists that all they were gonna do in Delaware County was visit uh, the emergency rooms when they're called, visit overdose patients, and try to get them at that time on a road to recovery. We knew we couldn't just keep administering naloxone. We need to change their lives, and we need to get them on that road. Our two certified recovery specialists started in 2014. That is now up to three recovery specialists. We hope to add to that as we go on. They have touched and reached over 1,000 people to try to get them on the road to recovery, try to get them off the addiction path. That, those are a couple of items that we were doing at the county, important items. After the recovery specialist, we knew we needed beds, additional beds. And I, see, I saw Dave Moran here someplace from, uh, right here from Crozier. We worked and partnered with Crozier, because as I said in the beginning, my, one of my first sentences, we knew we had to partner with a lot of groups to make sure we win this battle. We partnered with Crozier to uh, open a 52 bed uh, facility, the first step detox facility. We were able to get, with the help of uh, Senator Killian, because this money did come from the state, we were able to get a grant 
of nearly a million dollars to help them start this facility. I think within the first two or three weeks that facility was filled and it has continued to be filled since. We are going to work with senators and the state legislator, as Tom stated, to get additional funding. We know the next step, I certainly believe the next step in this war is treatment and getting these people off these drugs. Uh, after we've, we've also started a program called the Second Chance Courts in Delaware County. I believe it's the first uh, courts of its kind. Second Chance Courts, what we're finding is uh, these, these drug users, the uh, young people, they were uh, breaking into cars, they were uh, doing petty thefts, if you will, just to be able to pay for their heroin and their opioid addiction. And what we're finding, by the time they were arrested and the time they went into media to court, it was about a four to six month stage. During that four to six months, they're not getting any help. Matter of fact, they're making things worse on themselves because they're going back to using, they're going back to stealing, and they're making their, their world and their life even worse. So we instituted a second chance court. That was with the district attorney, Delaware County Council, and in cooperation with our uh, board of judges who have done a great job working with us on uh, so this. That second chance court, from the time you go in front of the district justice, which is very quickly after being arrested, a matter of days, we will get you on a path as part of your bond. We will get you treatment. As part of you remaining free, remaining out on bond, you will have to go through treatment. As soon as you stop doing the treatment, your bond is revoked, you could be arrested at that time. But instead of waiting the four to six months till they get into a, a common pleas court and go to court, we're getting them hopefully within a couple days to get back on treatment. That program just started back in February, March of this year, been very successful so far. And we're gonna continue that, we're gonna expand it as much as we have to, uh, the ability, uh, our ability allows us to make sure these young people are being taken care of. There are just a couple of the items. As Jack stated, what we are now doing, because uh, even to make it easier, we have 50 or so uh, drop boxes throughout the county. We are now gonna have a van going to as many, if not all, the shredding events. We all know about shredding events. You bring up your papers. We have our medicine drop boxes going there now. There'll be a portable medicine drop box that will be paid for Del by Delaware County and, uh, and the uh, district attorney's office. With someone there that will uh, stand by it, that you can drop your, when you're getting your paper shredded, bring your, uh, your, your medicines up, your prescriptions up. And whatever you want, black out your name, you have the ability to drop them off there. We are trying to make it as easy as possible for you to get rid of all of your medicines, all your unwanted medicines, and to keep them out of the hands of the people we don't want them in. We are, as I said, you'll see a van going around and you'll be able to have the opportunity to drop them, those things off. These are a couple items that we have and are doing now since 2012. And, and I, I am very happy what the, the Senator stated. In Delaware County, we were the first, I believe, to see this problem, face it head on, and we have done an incredible amount of initiatives, and we're gonna continue this. One thing I can tell you for sure, we won't give up until we win this battle in this war. But it's gonna be an effort that all of us have to undertake. And it, it sometimes feels like an uphill battle, but I know we are winning. I can tell by the 600 lives that we saved with Norcan. That's an easy statistic to look at and to notice. So I thank you very much for the opportunity tonight and to be here. I thank you for everything you're doing and continued success on all of our work. And we will win this war on drug addiction. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We're ready to resume the program. Uh, before we get started back to the program, I just want to uh, remind everyone there should be a flyer in your packet about wardrobes for work. And to give you a brief uh, sort of overview of this program, this is the donation of gently worn clothing, men and women, 
that will then be provided to individuals for them to go to job interviews or to work. So you will see there are big blue bins that are located and we have been, uh, Delaware County has been very generous in providing us space in both the uh, Jen Mataloni, the Register of Wills, uh, District Attorney's Office, and now the, as well, we are very thankful to have the sheriff also provide opportunities for donation bins in their office space. We have three donation locations here at Newman. We have Brinker Simpson, we have the Concordville Cleaners out in uh, Brinton Lakes. We also have Saul Ewing Law Firm and many others. So if you're interested in having a bin placed in your place of employment, we would be happy to do that. If you have donations, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to find a way to get the clothing from you. And finally, any of the donation spots that we have, just go to our website and we actually have a GPS that's a tracker there so you have locations where you can donate. If you also have groups that are in need of the clothing, please feel free to contact me. We're happy to have an opportunity for one of two things to happen. The individuals can come for the clothing or we can schedule a time for a group to come in so they can take part in actually receiving clothing for free. We have over 3,000 pieces of clothing from the generous donations of those folks here in the county. So with that uh, infomercial on my part, I'll switch back over to Dave Moran, who is the clinical director at Crozier Chester Medical. Crozier Chester has a First Steps Treatment Center supported by almost $1 million in funding from Delaware County. It was made possible by the allocation of the county's Office of Behavioral Health, Division of Drug and Alcohol, and the county's reinvestment funds. They have opened a 52-bed hospital and non-hospital detox and rehab unit to assist with the ongoing prevention problems and programs here in Delaware County. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dave Moran. Um, as I said, I'm Dave Moran, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a certified addictions um, professional. And uh, that training, according to uh, studies, makes me an expert. And I'm an expert because I've spent five years studying the subject. I'm also in recovery, and I've had 25 years of long-term recovery. So I guess I would be an expert in that. I also had 20 years of active uh, heroin addiction and other substance abuse. So I guess I would be an expert in that as well. Um, I, I'm going to talk, I was just asked to talk a little bit about the differences of the opiates. So when we speak of opiates, we're talking about heroin, which is a street drug. It's uh, synthesized from opium and it's made illegally in most places in the world but it comes out of the ground as an opiate, it has to be harvested and it has to be manufactured. The other big word we're hearing a lot of is fentanyl. Fentanyl can, is usually pharmaceutical made, but what's happening is there's a lot of it coming from China and a lot of it's being made on the street. Carp fentanyl is a, a form of fentanyl, but the, the components of it are deadly. And what people are doing, they're trying to change the dynamics of the drug so it's not illegal because the chemical formula of the medication is made illegal. And if they change the formula a little bit, then it gets under the wall. Um, Clark fentanyl is killing people. I want to talk to you a little bit about personal experiences. A friend of mine, I called her after she lost her son. And as we went through the conversation and the loss and all that. When she was done, she asked me to look it up. And she said, you really need to investigate it. And I called the doctor at the lab that does our urine drug screens for community hospital. And uh, I asked him about testing for it. And he said he would, and they were looking into it. But he said, Dave, I got to tell you, anybody that's doing this drug is not coming into treatment. They will die as it hits their body. So what, what's happening here is these opiates, which are heroin and fentanyl, which is killing people and causing a lot of uh, concerns in our society. But there's other ones like the lauded 
oxycontin, Percocet. Uh, there, there's a number of other ones. I'm a little nervous now. I just drew a blank on the whole list of them. Um, they're available, and, and one of the things that people are comparing, like the 70s, and a lot of drugs came back from Vietnam. I think I paid a dollar fifty for a bag of heroin in 1973. Um, the difference now is when, and, and I knew what I was getting into then. I didn't know it would take me 20 years to get clean. I just thought I would try it and, and be done with it. Um, and I think that is what happened to the young people that in the 90s tried Oxycontin, thinking it was just a pill. Oxycontin is a strong medication. And after a couple weeks of using that, I think uh, research says five days, you become addicted to that medicine. Now you may not have a substance abuse disorder because that's kind of a little bit different than having to go through withdrawal. Substance abuse disorder, simply put, when somebody's diagnosed with a substance use disorder, they're being abused and not the medication, right? Because there's enough medication, enough liquor, enough drugs out there to last us an entire. I heard the other day that the United States uses 80% of the painkillers used in our world. And I don't think we have 80% more pain than the rest of the world. So there's a lot of talk about overdoses, um, deaths, um, the life that we're experiencing in our society, what we're doing, what's happening on the street, what the police are facing, what schools are facing. Um, what we're here to talk about, what I'm here to talk about <clears throat> is recovery. I have, I operate a license for um, substance abuse treatment. We diagnose people with substance use disorders. Uh, we're licensed to treat addiction, but we're in the business of recovery. When people come to us, we put an infrastructure in place um, to offer people recovery. So I have slides. And like other people have said, the overdoses are going up. Um, they're going up with blacks and uh, women and some of the areas and some of the uh, demographics that we hadn't seen before. So basically, simply put, it's happening for everybody at every level, at, 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 every, um, at every section of society. I was at a meeting the other day and I presented to um, senior health and the senior care centers, the nursing homes, are having problems with that um, 60 and, and 70s generation that are in nursing homes that um, have addiction from street drugs and prescription drugs. There is an opi opiate epidemic in Pennsylvania. There's also an epidemic of recovery that's happening. Um, we don't want to lose fat, uh, we don't want to lose fate, uh, sight of the idea that there's not only an opiate epidemic, alcohol is still um, very prevalent and causing problems and alcohol can cause maybe even more serious problems. And the fact that it's a uh, accepted substance, especially in, uh, in high schools and, and in colleges. Um, so th these slides are set up to introduce you to the new program that is offered by Crozier, and that's the 52-bed unit that Dave White spoke of. We have it through funding of the Office of Behavioral Health. Uh, if they did not support that, I don't know that we would have it. I've been pushing to, to get us to open up an inpatient unit for five years, and when we started to get the financial support and the community support, it started to happen. So um, we've been assessing, so here's why, and here's a dilemma that I see every day. When I want to walk into work every day, there's between 10 and 15 people waiting to be assessed to go into treatment almost every day, and that's just one site. Jack Whalen talked about Narcan. I, I appreciate that, I appreciate it because I was Narcan three times. I believe it works. I don't believe when people say, why are you giving this to people, to addicts? Um, it has helped me. I, don't, I wouldn't be here if somebody didn't bring that back. Jack Whalen has put it into police officers' hands for them to be able to do it, but he also um, put a, a light bulb in my head and I asked the hospital to provide it at our site because we were having 
problems with overdoses in our assessment some center when people were coming in waiting to be assessed to go into treatment. Um, I have Narcan two people. There's two patients that were fathers or are fathers, that are sons, that are brothers, that are alive because there was Narcan there. Um, and it's a subtle thing. I walked in, everybody said the guy was asleep. I came back in an hour and I said he's not asleep. I put ice on him, he didn't respond. He didn't respond to a second Narcan. And some of the uh, medications, some of the drugs that are in the heroin, the fentanyl, are making it, um, th that are so strong that the, the police and the paramedics and stuff are needing as many as five and six shots of Narcan to bring people back. Um, so, Crozier Chester Medical Center has been awarded grants from the county to start the inpatient unit. We also received a grant from uh, the state and governor's office, as Tom Killian said, um, to put a nurse, a manager, a social worker, and certified recovery specialist in the community. These people will go out in the community, will, they'll come into, what we do is we go into the prison, we go into the courts, we go into the magistrate's office, we'll go into the doctor's office, we'll go into the hospital, we'll go into the school, anywhere you invite us. I'll give you the number as, as I proceed through this uh, presentation. We will come in and we will interview people, we will assess them, and our job is to create a warm handoff so that when we interact with that person, we find them a bed and we'll get them to a bed or to somebody that will help them get a bed. I can't guarantee that we will get a bed that day for everybody because of supply and demand. We opened 52 beds on March 22nd. On April 10th, we were full. We could have filled the beds in two days if uh, we had the ability to get them in. Just nursing and uh, physician staff was overwhelmed with the, with the influx. Um, we also got a grant, as Dave White said, to um, offer certified recovery specialists. So if there's an overdose and we get the call, we will go in and we will talk to that person and we will engage them and plant the seed and offer them a warm handoff. If they're interested in treatment, we'll make the arrangements to follow them through. And if we don't get them in treatment that day, we will continue to follow them, interact with them, call them, bug them, harass them, and maybe stalk them. Um, all kidding aside, over and over again, we started this in October. In, in February, we had somebody that we engaged in October to come in and, and ask for the guy that did the, uh, the intervention in the hospital bed. And he said that the guy was haunting him for the last three months and he was looking for help. Um, so we also have the Perinatal Center of Excellence, which is also a, a, a grant, and that is from Keystone First. Um, the insurance companies are saying this is a problem, we need help. Now, uh, this program, we have a couple ladies that work with the uh, Center of Excellence for the neonatal syndrome, and that is the abstinence syndrome that happens when a mother is addicted to a medication, whether she knows it or not, and she delivers a baby, that baby goes into withdrawal as soon as they cut the cord because the baby's on its own and um, it doesn't have the narcotic going into its system anymore. It's a horrendous experience. A Crozier not only has this neonatal abstinence syndrome that will follow the, the, um, the, the pregnant mother through pregnancy, and offer treatment for the mother and, and the child. But we also have uh, a PEDS unit that has treatment that is geared toward that. And the experience I had 10 years ago when I was called into maternity, because the nurses and the managers were struggling with how, how to treat these babies. You walk in, and the experience I had, you walked in and you could hear the baby scream. Nobody had to tell me what that was. It's, it's, it's hard curling. Um, Deb Bonner and the staff over there, the doctors, um, instituted this unit. It's low stimuli, and the symptoms, are, are, the symptoms of withdrawal are reduced by the stimuli and the treatment. And it's not all medications. It's people. It's loving. It's nurturing. And that's what we see in the, in the long run with um, children that are nurtured early on and throughout their lifespan do well, the ones that aren't, and live in a 
broken homes and all the uh, tragedy that comes with addiction, uh, suffer trauma and, and all the experiences that come with that, including dysfunction. Uh, the units that we open, uh, there's, there's two units, first floor and second floor. Um, there's 10 detox beds and 10 rehab beds that are medically monitored and, and, or medically managed, and that means that there's a doctor involved. It would be somebody that maybe had a heart condition and uh, is in withdrawal, um, kidney failure and withdrawal, or psychiatric condition and withdrawal. The second floor is uh, medically monitored. There's doctors involved. The focus isn't on the medical side of things, although we offer those treatments. Um, th these programs uh, uh, through the county and through the five county area are, are non-hospital. They're considered non-hospital. We have it in the hospital. The benefits of that are that we have the hospital staff and the hospital services available if any emergencies come up or any complications come with withdrawal and early recovery. Uh, the team is led by Dr. Michael, Rick Yuri, and Quinn Fabian. Um, we also have BSWs and uh, uh, practical nurse practitioners, LPNs, RNs. It's fully staffed and it's fully staffed medically. Um, I've been talking about the support. Prospect Medical Holdings bought Crozier in July of uh, last year, 2016, and they have supported us. They have um, helped us and, and you know, blessed the, uh, the growth of these programs. The, the First Steps program, um, so we detox people. We use medication. But we also use the same thing as it, the NAS babies, it, it's like low stimuli, treatment, nurturing group. People are assigned um, a treatment program. They're not just stuck in the hospital and we you know, put them in bed and give them medications. We also offer yoga, music therapy, acupuncture, and psychodrama. Um, if anybody asks, I'm gonna volunteer with psychodrama. So here's some numbers. Um, the next bunch of slides are going to have numbers. Um, so the first step number is up there. Uh, the admission is still through. All right, so first steps detox is at Crozier Hospital. The access center does the assessments, and um, people to, to get into first steps, they got to go to the community hospital, which is three miles away. It's the old Sacred Heart. We're at 2600 West 9th Street. Um, Emissions, hours of emission are Monday through Friday. Um, we don't have weekend emissions now, and else you're in the hospital and not the ER or hospital bed. Um, Crozier Chester Medical Center's commitment to the community and active substance abuse programs have been in place for 45 years. Um, we have strong addiction, inpatient, psychiatric, and outpatient. We treat 5,500 people a year in the Sacred Heart Building and outpatient medical and drug and alcohol programs. Um, the inpatient program encourages strong family involvement. We do in outpatient, uh, not a lot show up. I think I said this on March 22nd, we opened and early April we were full. Our Center of Excellence team, um, they are licensed, credentialed nurses, uh, and certified recovery specialists. Um, this number, anybody that wants information, now this goes the gamut. If you're a patient, you're somebody that wants help, you can call this number, 497-610-497-7336. If you're a doctor and you want education for your, your team, you call this number, the team will go out. Um, if you're a judge or a magistrate, you want an education, this team will come out. If you work in the schools, this team will come out. We are dedicated to do the education. Um, I was in network marketing a couple years ago. My friends were making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of them made millions. I'm like, God, why isn't this happening to me? It took me a year of therapy <laughs> for the therapist to point out Dave, you went to school for social work, you love what you do, why are you trying to do something else? 
So I tell the story because I was, I was told I had to make a mission statement for this network marketing. And my mission statement came down to this. 80% of society's ills are being caused by the 10% of the population that are diagnosable with substance use disorder. My mission statement is to bring that education to anywhere, any way, anyhow. And what goes along with that is the hope of recovery. And Sean's going to talk about that in a little bit. Again, we're not just in the addiction treatment. We're in the recovery business. We offer hope. We offer an infrastructure to educate, provide warrant handoffs, to provide services, and to provide treatment at any level of care for anybody um, that's a Delaware County resident. And if they're not, we will connect them to the center of excellence in the other counties that have the same kind of grants and the same kind of infrastructure. We're just better. And, and <laughs> thank you. I, I don't think that it's ego. And here's my experience. When I talk to people and I have a little interaction, I'm in some national um, associations. And when I talk about the infrastructure of having 25 IOP groups and 25 counselors that deliver substance use treatment and, and the inpatient units and the support services, the COE and the NAS and the case management services that we offer people, people are blown away. In, in Florida, there's a lot of hype about Florida's rehabs. When you get out of that and your insurance doesn't work anymore, there's no help. In Delaware County, the county really reinforces the connection with welfare it's streamlined that when somebody signs up for welfare, they go right to Magellan and that, that insurance is kicked in and treatment is, is provided. That frees up county funding for the uninsured. So we have services available in Delaware County that are outside of what's available in the rest of the country. And the infrastructure, especially in Crozier Chester, it covers all levels of care and all needs of what um, somebody suffers from substance use disorder could need. We have intensive, intensive cases, uh, slow down here. Intensive case managers. We have intensive outpatient, which is three days a week, three hours a day. Uh, we have methadone, uh, IOP, which is the same thing, but somebody gets methadone, they come in and they get dosed every day. Um, it's a maintenance program, so methadone is an opiate. It's a synthetic opiate, so it's not street heroin, and the philosophy behind methadone is that people receive the uh, narcotic daily so that they don't have to seek street drugs. Um, we have just started a program, Expected Mothers Managing Addiction, Emma where this is an evidence-based program. It uses C CBD techniques to help mothers deal with pregnancy, um, what's going to be expected when your child's uh, born, the withdrawal that the child will go through, and resourcing with our NAS um, Center of Excellence and providing support through the pregnancy and postpartum, and we'll follow the people two years, correct? We all, our, our, our treatments are evidence-based, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing. Um, there's an integrated uh, illness management and recovery, and, and that's a curriculum that was developed by somebody in recovery that integrates healthcare, uh, mental illness, and substance abuse treatment in, in, in like a curriculum, almost like a school thing. When you start to introduce to um, somebody recovering from addiction, and you start to introduce to them that their diet and their exercise might be something they want to look at, they'll engage you a little bit better than when you talk to them about how much they're drinking or how much they're using. Um, we follow people and we can follow people in an outpatient setting for two years or longer if it's needed. The uh, evidence-based treatments, um, are available, they're evidence-based, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service uh, Association uh, through the federal government has approved these evidence-based programs to say that research has proved that these programs work and they help relieve symptoms and people get better, feel better, and do better. 
Um, all right, so the set, again, the center of excellence teams for the opiate disorder or the NAS, we will come out to wherever you work, whatever you're involved in, and we will do education and offer um, screening assessment, peer support, and warm handoffs to uh, provide access to treatment for people. Um, I'm not going to read this or go throw it. There's another team that Dave talked about, I started to touch, touch on, and that's the CRSs for the ER, and these are recovery specialists, people that have been in recovery, and they'll come in and engage people after an overdose and try to connect them to services and continue to work with them. That number is 610-497-7278. We got some numbers up here. So we started doing this. We took this over from the county, Crozier did, took it over in, from the county in October of 2016. And since then, we've engaged 546 people. We have 188 that we know got into treatment as a result of that. And uh, there's a number of people that we continue to work with. Um, I talked about, and I want to repeat things, so I talked about the levels of care, what we have to offer. One of the things I didn't talk about is medicated assisted treatment, and medicated assisted treatment is uh, methadone, which is a synthetic opiate, suboxone, which is partly naltrexone, which is Narcan, you heard a lot about that. So that blocks the opiate, so that if you take a drug, you won't feel it. But there's another side of it, um, the subutex, which goes into the body and acts as an opiate, so they, they don't need to uh, continue to use street drugs. Um, so if they take any, they won't feel the reward, and they're getting a certain amount of a narcotic uh, agonist, is what it's called. So the need to use is less, the craving is less, and they're... Um, need to go out and create crimes and do whatever to support their addiction should be minimized. Uh, and Vivitrol is an injection of naloxone and it blocks the opiate for 30 days. So if we gave Sean a shot of Vivitrol, he would not be able to feel any opiates for 30 days. And if he got in an accident on the way home, they'd have to do something because the, the doctors wouldn't have any normal narcotics to um, ease his pain. Um, I pick on Sean because he's going to pick on me in a couple of minutes. Um, so I think I have a little bit more time and I'll ask for questions. I, I, I want to share with you uh, an experience I had this morning. Yeah, yesterday I got a call from a friend that uh, this guy that is a friend of mine is in treatment in Florida. and. Um, his son died over the weekend. So I was on the phone this morning with a guy in treatment recovering from his opiate addiction. And I had to walk him through how he's going to handle um, coming back, doing what he needs to do, supporting the family, and going back to treatment in a couple of days. And, and I can't tell you the pain of having to deliver that kind of message. Um, here's a guy that's trying to do the best he can. He's in a medical facility recovering from a medical disorder, and he's being hit with the grief of his 20-year-old son overdosing um, from street drugs. But the thing that I'm sharing this with you about, and the thing that gets me choked up, is the resilience of people in recovery. And Sean's going to talk about that as well. The resilience and the hope of people coming into recovery and the things that we're working for in providing this infrastructure is that they will come back into society and offer you something and give back to society like they have never been able to do before. And, and they really have to. It's like recovering from trauma. If you don't do something with that pain, uh, as you experience and so many of us experience the loss of loved ones, if you don't do something with that pain, it's going to haunt you until you do. And, uh, and Dave White spoke of a woman who experienced the loss of her son, and she turned that into the note and is going into all the schools doing things like that. There, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of support, there's a lot of recovery in, in our county. Um, please, if you don't have access to it, use some of these numbers. Um, we're all over the, the internet, the web. If you call that number, 610-497-7336, somebody will get back to you. Um, if there's anything that I can do, you heard my mission statement. I live this, I do what I can, I do as much as I can and more. And like people like Sean and so many other people in the room, um, we're dedicated to offer change to people that want it and we offer hope. And I thank you for your attention today and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you to Crozier Keystone for the incredible program that has been created and all that you do. And at this time, we would like to introduce Sean Rogers to discuss what he'd like to talk about today. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Rogers and I am a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is that I haven't had a drink or a drug since December 27th of 2011. I say that uh, because it's really important that we talk about recovery uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with this issue of uh, opioid abuse, uh, substance use disorder, uh, because as, as, I, as I always talk about with my good friend Dave Moran who just spoke, is that uh, we are doing a disservice to our local community if we're only talking about the problem and not talking about the solution. And, uh, and that's really important to me. That's really close to my heart. Um, I, I, I have had the great opportunity uh, to um, you know, do a lot of service work uh, in this field. Uh, I, about three and a half years ago, I took over as the special events coordinator for uh, Young People in Recovery, which is a Philadelphia-based chapter uh, that puts on different uh, community service events to show people in recovery that not only uh, do we recover, but we can have fun while in recovery. Um, I don't know uh, if anybody is familiar with uh, a Stand Up for Recovery comedy series that I started. We just had our last show at Villanova University. Uh, and, and these are all things to show people that, that uh, you know, recovery is just the beginning of your journey, it's not the end. Uh, because for me, when I came in at the age of 26, I really thought my life was over. Uh, I thought I was doomed to a life of just absolute boringness and, and, and meetings and, and, and just like nothing good was going to come of this. And, uh, and, and, and really, honestly, my, uh, my journey has proved to me quite the opposite. Uh, I've had great opportunities and, and doors open up all over. Uh, to really talk about the hope and recovery, talk about the solution-based message that uh, was so freely given to me uh, very early on. Um, you know, Dave did a really good job of really talking about some of the local initiatives that are going on. Uh, and, and, and I'm always, um, you know, I, I've had the great pleasure of uh, working with uh, District Attorney Jack Whalen and, and Councilman Dave White. And, and I, I really can't say enough about the proactiveness that this, co this county has had. Uh, regarding this disease over the past three or four years and uh, really putting together initiatives that not only help save lives but start people's journey into recovery. Um, you know, I, 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 Dave was talking about Narcan and, and um, about two months ago I had a gentleman uh, who uh, was in a uh, recovery related, um, uh, we, we were at a meeting, right, and this, this, guy, this guy just fell out of his seat and uh, his face went blue and his lips went purple and uh, you know everybody in the room was, was freaking out and uh, we had this uh, wonderful young woman who had just took it she just took CPR training because she's going to be a lifeguard this summer and uh, she started to provide CPR to this gentleman and, and nothing was happening and we were all pretty terrified uh, of this moment and uh, the, the, the Nether Providence officer who responded to the scene came in uh, had Narcan right on his keychain and provided it to the gentleman and the gentleman uh, woke up right away uh, quite startled at the whole entire incident and uh, and for me that's just another uh, clear-cut example of uh, you know uh, providing that opportunity for that gentleman to be uh, awoken to this opportunity of, of maybe possibly 
uh, segue in his journey uh, of recovery in a different direction, just like Dave kind of talked about. And, uh, and there's been a lot of discussions around Narcan as to like, you know, are we creating uh, a pillow? Or are we creating an opportunity for the addict to continue to use? And uh, my personal take on that uh, is that, uh, you know, we've been given this great opportunity. We've been given this, this, this drug, uh, and, and it's not our right to choose who lives and who doesn't because we don't know what their journey is going to look like further on down the line, and we don't really know what their life looks like in so far as participating to the solution, maybe further on down the line with their story. Um, and that's just my personal take. That's my personal opinion. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've also been uh, a part of... Uh, in my own hometown community, Springfield Cares Coalition, and helping to develop a, uh, you know, uh, a coalition that we put together about 13 months ago. Uh, you know, and, and really, honestly, the whole main purpose of starting that coalition was that I had felt, along with a few other members of our local community, that uh, you know, we were focusing too much on the population of 20, 18 to 26 and 26 and above, but what were we doing about the school systems? What were we doing to go in and talk to the middle schoolers and the high schoolers and really give them the education and information needed and necessary to really understand that uh, substance use disorder is a real thing, such as mental health is, and uh, it's okay to ask for help, because uh, I think that gets lost in the message, right? Uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that was brought to my attention in January was that uh, we were in a meeting talking about setting up our town hall meeting uh, this past month, and, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the women who was there, she was there on behalf of uh, Congressman Mann's uh, office, and, 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 and she didn't say anything that was, uh, I, I would fault her for, but, but you know, it, it kind of spoke to the stigma around addiction. She said, why don't we host this town hall meeting about addiction, and this way we'll get rid of addiction in our community. And I know that she didn't say that out of harm, but my heart jumped out of my chest because I thought to myself, we are, we, we are trying to focus on getting rid of addiction. We're not going to get rid of addiction. We're not going to get rid of people who uh, suffer from substance use disorder. Uh, what, what we're going to do, or what we should be doing in my mind, is providing the education and information to let people know that it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to get help. And furthermore, um, let people know that it's okay to talk about this, this disease. Uh, because if we don't talk about it, we further promote stigma and we're part of the problem and not part of the solution. And, uh, and, and that's something that's been really uh, clear and evident to me along my journey. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very blessed um, to, to have the life I have today. Um, you know, on December 26th of 2011, a day before I, I had uh, re-entered treatment, for the last time, God willing, uh, you know, I was homeless, I was helpless, and uh, and I really got to a point in my life where uh, I, I I remember one of the last thoughts I had before I entered treatment was like how how did how did I end up here? You know what I mean? I had so much potential, I had so much hope, and and, and throughout throughout the course of my life, I was given all the opportunities necessary to succeed, and and I just couldn't I couldn't fathom how I ended up becoming. Uh, someone who had to have heroin uh, in my body on a daily basis in order just to perform as a normal human being, to, in order to just function. And, uh, and I certainly never imagined my life would come to living out of a uh, 1997 Nissan Maxima and sleeping in the Springfield Mall parking lot. You know what I mean? That's just not who I thought I was going to be when I grew up. And, uh, and one of the greatest lines I've ever heard when we're talking about this disease of addiction, uh, disease of alcoholism, and we're talking about recovery is that, like, not, nobody in their right mind grows up uh, playing in their parents' backyard saying, you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be an addict. Nobody grows up with that mentality. You know, I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a police officer. I didn't want to be an addict when I grew up. Uh, but what, what took place for me and, and what my experience is is that when I put a drink or a drug in my body, I react differently than, than a normal human being to that. You know what I mean? When, 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 my, when, when I see my father, he comes home from work and, and he runs a, a, a business locally in our community and he has a few drinks and he can go to bed. You know, that's just not me. If I have a few drinks, I'm off to the races and I want to close the bar down and I think I'm going to Vegas the next day. You know what I mean? And that's just, that's just who I am, man. I'm just, I, I don't react normally and sanely to alcohol or drugs. And, uh, and really, honestly, I think the best way to describe our disease is it's not about the alcohol or the drugs. I have a disease and more. I don't know when to stop or regulate. And, uh, and, and, and for me, it took a couple times. Uh, it, it, I was not a first-time winner. Uh, it took a couple times coming into uh, treatment. Uh, it took a couple times, uh, you know, uh, uh, of coming in and out of the rooms of, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Narcotics Anonymous and uh, 
And, 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 and for me, like, I didn't get it right away. I didn't really understand the, the, the severity of the disease I was dealing with. And, uh, and, and, and really, honestly, I, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I couldn't see the mess that I was creating in other people's lives around me. And, uh, and I came to realize that on, on my last run uh, that, that all these things I had done for so many years uh, you know, were, were, were really, like, I had finally, finally, finally felt the pain I was putting everybody through in my life. And, uh, and, and it brought me to um, uh, December 25th of 2011, I walked into my parents' house for Christmas dinner thinking it was going to be like every other Christmas dinner uh, on the years prior. And, uh, and, you know, I had some really strong parents. I had some really strong loved ones around me who understood what it meant to enable somebody. And, uh, and I didn't live with my parents at the time, and and and, and uh, you know I, I was I was kind of not really participating in, in family at that point in time. I kind of was like hiding from everybody and isolating. And uh, and my father was a very strong human being, and he just said, "Listen, I don't want you in my life anymore until you get your life together." And uh, he said, "We've done all we can do for you. It, it, it's time for you to get get your stuff together and uh, get out of my house." And uh, you know, I'm forever grateful for that moment because without without a strong human being like my father to, to do that to one of his sons is, I don't know that I would ever, uh, you know, took the next couple steps to like get myself into a treatment center and seek the help that I needed. And uh, and really, honestly, my path is a little bit different than most. I didn't go to treatment for 30 days the last time. Uh, I went to treatment for five days and, and, and a very nice nurse who I'm still friends with today, she came down. Uh, on the unit at Miramont and just said, uh, unfortunately, your insurance is up. You got to go tomorrow. And I was in the middle of a pretty horrific detox. And, uh, and I really didn't have any answers. And, and, and what happened that night is, is pretty profound. I, I, uh, I was told that news and I went back up to my room and detox and, and, and I really wanted to just get into self-pity mode. And, uh, and this clinical aide at Miramont, she still works there today. She came up to my, she walked in my room just as I was starting to like get pissed off and pack my stuff up. And she said, sit down. Uh, and I sat down on the edge of the bed and she said, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to ask for help and, uh, and, 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 and you're going to be okay. And, uh, and I did, I prayed with that clinical aid that night and I went down to McCutcheon Hall and, uh, you know, uh, Miramont alumni has a pretty fantastic thing that they do every year's Eve and I'm a part of it now today. And, uh, and they had some old alumni come in and speak and a couple guys with a few years talked about how they went to this place called Levittown and they went to a recovery house and, uh, and I didn't know anything about Levittown. I'd never been up that way. And uh, uh, all I knew is that the next morning I was checking out and I really had no place to go. I was going to be homeless. And, uh, and I went up to this guy uh, and I asked him for help. And, and, and he said, absolutely, dude, we'll save you a bet. Uh, you're more than welcome to come into our program. And uh, I went to this program the next day. And, and, and I was terrified, man. I pulled up to this house and I was getting dropped off. And, uh, and it was a house no bigger than my parents' house that I grew up in in Springfield, and there was probably 21 guys out front smoking cigs, and I thought, there's no way all these guys live there, and they all told me that they lived there, and I was terrified. <laughs> and, uh, and I just never thought my life had, was going to, was, you know, I never, I never thought at 26 I was going to be living with like 20 dudes and sleeping on, on top bunk in this bed in Life of Town. And, uh, and God knew, like, that's what I needed. Like, that's exactly what I needed. And uh, I, I needed the direction. I needed the accountability. I needed the structure. And I needed to start, like, you know, I needed to start to participate in my recovery. And, uh, and I didn't know what that looked like, and I really wasn't sure as to what direction that was going to take. And uh, I was in this house for three days, and this guy, Dan Kay, he used to come in every Monday night in our kitchen. And, uh, and, he would, and he would do this big book study, and, uh, and he would talk about recovery in a, in a really passionate way. And, and he talked about how he had eight years of sobriety, and I, I couldn't fathom eight years because I had eight days at this point in time. And, uh, and he was running this big book study, and he just lifted up his head, and he said, why would you sit in a 12-step fellowship and not work the 12 steps? You'd have to be crazy to do something like that. And, uh, and it just hit me, man. Like, that's the only thing I hadn't done. I had never participated in my recovery. I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't work the steps. And... Uh, and my point to the story is that, like, from that day on, like, I started to work the steps with the gentleman who was in that room that night, and my life started to change little by little. And, uh, and, and I was able to, like, recover. Uh, I'm not cured. I was able to recover, as me and Dave talk about so often. And, uh, and, and, and my life uh, started to get, to get better in the sense that, like, I started to have, like, family members come back into my life and tell me that I had changed and, uh, and that, that it was okay to come back into their lives. And... Uh, and then I started to have friends and, and, and relatives that I had, I had made amends to, and like my relationships started to be restored overall. And, uh, and I was in this house for, for <laughs> the funniest part about that is that 
That night that I asked that gentleman to help me in McCutcheon Hall, I thought to myself after he said, yes, cool, I'm going to stay there for 30 days and I'm going to get back to Delaware County. And, uh, you know, I make plans and God laughs. And, uh, and, and, and what happened was I ended up staying there for a year and a half and uh, I became a manager in that program and I oversaw a couple of the houses and I, I started to really get involved in service and recovery and it really started to change the way I viewed the world and uh, it really started to change the way I viewed a lot of things. Uh, I remember having like this revelation at one year sober that like uh, I was driving down from Levittown to my home group on Thursday nights in Springfield called The Joy of Living and uh, and, and, and I thought to myself, everything that I thought was important in my life a year ago really isn't important at all. And everything that is important to me today, I never thought would be important to me. And, uh, you know, I always thought like money and, and power and prestige and like being somebody was like important. And then a year later, what I realized is like giving back to other people and, and, and really less of self, more of others is like really important to me today. And like, how can I do that on like a full time basis? And, uh, and I used to pray about that. I used to, I used to ask like, God to like help me out with that decision and uh, and I was three years sober and a buddy of mine approached me and he said to me uh, he said listen I know you work for this bank and, and I worked for Univest Bank at the time as a broker uh, Nick was actually one of my clients who's sitting in the crowd now and uh, and uh, and this guy called me and he said listen like you're really enthusiastic about this recovery thing any chance you could come help us like market uh, th this new facility that's just opened up in Westchester and uh, and I said, yeah, dude, I'd love to. I've been waiting for that opportunity to work in this field full time. And, uh, and, and, and I, I actually went to uh, meet up with Dave, uh, who just spoke up here. And I said, Dave, uh, <laughs> I said, what do you think? I think this is a dumb idea. You know what I mean? Like the money, between me, the money wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near what I was making. And uh, I just thought like, this is, this is stupid. Like there's no way I can walk away from this job. And Dave said, uh, listen, dude, he said, you come here every Monday night and you talk your head off about recovery and how you want to be involved in this process. He said, don't worry about the money, follow your passion, kid. And, uh, and I'm grateful for Dave saying that to me uh, in media that Monday night because I left there and uh, I went in and I interviewed with this company the next day and I, I gave my two weeks. And I remember my boss at Univest saying, like, uh, he just, he just, he said the nicest thing I've ever heard a boss say. He just said, listen, dude, if it doesn't work out, you always have a job here. You've been a great, you've been a great employee to me. I don't care if you're, you have to come back a year or two years, three years later, you're always welcome back at Univest. And like, for me, like a person in recovery who had ripped and run for so many years and created so much chaos in other people's lives to hear another human being say like, dude, you're always welcome. Open door policy. Come on back. Like that was awesome. And that's a direct result of like actually participating in my recovery and suiting up and showing up for other individuals on a daily basis because it's not about me anymore. And I've learned that over time. And, uh, and I took that job and, uh, and I learned a lot at that job. And, and in February of this past year, I got a call uh, uh, on a Monday. <laughs> I was going into work and this guy got my number uh, from a few people locally and uh, he was in Texas and he said, listen, uh, we really, we're looking for a national clinical representative for our program in Lubbock, Texas. And he said, uh, he said, I've, I've talked to a lot of people in the Philadelphia area about you and you seem pretty passionate about recovery. He said, if, you, if you'll get on a plane tomorrow, we'd love to interview you Tuesday afternoon in Lubbock. And, uh, and like beyond my wildest dreams, crazy, right? Uh, I remember calling Dave right after I got that call and saying like, what, do I, what should I do? And he said, you got nothing to lose, kid. And, uh, and I hopped on a plane and I went to Lubbock and uh, I had no idea where Lubbock was. I had no idea what Lubbock, Texas was about. And, uh, and, and, and I found out a lot about Lubbock. It's, it's, it's the home of Texas Tech. And uh, I got off the plane and I hopped in the car with the CEO and I said, hey, listen, I'm a big Aggies fan. And he said, don't ever say that again. <laughs> this is Red Raiders country. <laughs> And, uh, and I took this interview with this facility in Texas and, uh, and, and, and I learned some really cool stuff. I went out to lunch with their, their founder at 12.30 uh, on Wednesday afternoon and, and we didn't get up from the lunch table to 5.30 p.m. And we just talked about recovery for five hours. And what this lady taught me was that in 1986 she stood in front of Congress and she asked Congress for a grant to start this collegiate recovery program at Texas Tech. And they laughed her out of the room and six months later they sent her an apology with a $59,000 grant to start this collegiate recovery program at Texas Tech University. And she started it and she ran with it. And in 2002 she was approached by a uh, private equity investor to start uh, the clinical process, the clinical program, which is called the Ranch at Dubtree. And, uh, and what she wanted to do is she wanted to help young men and young women get sober, get clean and go back to college uh, at Texas Tech through the collegiate recovery program. And she wanted it so bad that she... Uh, <laughs> She, she stalked alumni to, to raise money for this uh, $4 million endowment fund. And the endowment fund allows young men and young women to be provided with a scholarship to go back to Texas Tech after they complete our clinical process at the ranch. 
And, uh, and she, she walked with me at 5.30 p.m. over to the CEO's office and she said to, she said to Doug, I'll never forget it, my heart was beating because I knew I was going to have to interview with Doug right after this. And she said, Doug, if you don't hire this kid, you're an idiot. And she said, good luck. And she walked out of the room. <laughs> and, uh, and they hired me as the National Clinical Outreach Rep. And, they, uh, and I have the great pleasure to work for them today. And I get to fly around the country and talk about recovery uh, as a full-time job. And, uh, and I'm blessed to do this. And I'm blessed to do this for one reason and one reason only. is because six years ago when everything hit the fan and my parents were in crisis and I didn't know what to do and my parents didn't know what to do. And we didn't know who to call or how to handle the situation because I was one of five kids and my parents never dealt with the, the, the disease of addiction or alcoholism. They never knew like, what this was all about or what was, what was next. Nobody gives you the book on how to deal with this stuff growing up. And, uh, and I now know today like I'm in a position where I get to travel the country, give my number out and tell people you can call me, there is hope. And, uh, and I'm there to help out. It doesn't matter if they go to our facility or not. I will help each and every individual find recovery, start their journey. And, uh, and you know, Dave like, mentioned a lot of stuff that, that's, that's going on locally uh, in this county um, with treatment centers and, and different, different opportunities to help people start their journey for recovery. But one thing we must never forget is that treatment is not the answer. Treatment is the opportunity to give the individual the information they need to continue on in their recovery. But treatment is never the end all be all. It's just the start of, it, of something much greater than ourselves. And, uh, and for me, that, I, I learned that the hard way after a couple failed attempts at treatment. And, uh, and what I know today is that, like, that like, it, it's really important that we, we talk about a message of hope. It's really important that we talk about the wins in recovery. Because right before I got up here, someone texted me uh, on the front page of the Daily Times. It says six ODs. And yes, that stuff's important. And, and yes, we need to talk about of telling people how their lives can get better as a result of getting into recovery and participating in the recovery. And we don't, we don't talk about the wins in recovery, the people that are staying sober and living in recovery on a daily basis and being people who are be able to give back to their society in, in, in major ways. Because I'm not, uh, you know, I talk about my story, but, but I'm blessed to know hundreds of other young men and young women from Delaware County that are doing just the same thing, if not better things. Uh, you know, I got two kids that, that, that are, I'm close friends, I say kids, they're, 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 they're two of my closest friends. And, and one of them, you know, got sober in 2015, and, 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 and in this past semester, Westchester University recognized this gentleman and recognized all the hard work he's been putting in since he got sober to create safe, sober environments on, on Westchester's campus, and now he has RAMS for recovery. It's the first ever collegiate recovery program at Westchester University. And, and this kid was on his deathbed in 2015. He wrapped a car around a tree, and everybody had given up on him. And, and, and fast forward a year and a half later, he's doing some amazing work at Westchester University. I got another buddy from Springfield, Delaware County that went back to school and recovered. He graduated from Philadelphia Sciences and then went to Temple for his graduate program. And, and in, in February of this year, Temple wrote a letter uh, stating that they're going to recognize you know, uh, his, him and a few other people on campus as the first ever collegiate recovery community to create safe, sober space on, on campus to help young men and young women go back to college, get sober, stay clean, and, and have a goal-oriented life with a degree. And, uh, and that stuff's important. You know, we, we, we have to talk about the wins in recovery. We have to talk about the hope in recovery. Because recovery is not the end, it's just the beginning. And uh, recovery is possible for anybody who wants to get this thing. But uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I'm going to kind of, what I learned early on is it's not for people who need it, it's not for people who want it, it's for people who do it. And we must do the action and recovery to get the results that we have today. So thanks for letting me speak, guys. I appreciate it. so much for that, John, for sharing that with us and all you're doing now moving forward. Now I would ask um, if the district attorney and Sean and Dave would come up and we have a number of questions um, from the audience and we will try to answer all of those for everyone to the panel. So the first question I have here um, is to the issue of someone who has a problem that you've identified. How do you talk to them about getting help? I had a guy in private practice last week. It's on. 
and so on. All right. so my answer is you talk to them any way you can. Um, I had a guy in private practice a couple weeks ago, and he came for a couple weeks. Him and his wife were having problems because of his drinking, and uh, she was getting ready to leave. And um, I had like three or four sessions with him, and then his wife came in, and I kind of felt like it was the last session, and I had talked in every which way I could. And when I reflect back on it, I was pr pretty brutal about the way I delivered the diagnosis of substance abuse and the um, impending doom that may be to follow. And uh, I often wonder, like, should I have talked to him a little different? Should I have been nicer? Um, and, and I go back to, I sense that it was the last session. I got a little frustrated. And I gave it to him bluntly. Um, they don't recommend that in interventions. They recommend that you do it with love, um, that you do it with a delivery that you care about the person. Um, but they also talk to you about delivering in a way that you're going to be able to follow through. And if you're going to make, um, if you're going to make consequences, you got to be able to follow through. So if you're going to, you know, if you're going to tell somebody that lives with you that you're kicking them out, don't say that if you're not going to follow through on it. And if you're not going to give them the car, don't say it if you're not going to follow through. So I, I think the answer needs to be sincerity. So however it comes out, and I'm looking at Terry back here. Terry, Terry B has helped me over the last 25 years m many times. And he wasn't always pretty when he delivered it, but it, it always worked and it helped because I knew where he was coming from. He was coming from his heart. So I suggest you come from your heart and uh, be kind to yourself about like the way it comes across. Um, it's a tense conversation and it's not always readily received. The person's not in control of what they're able to do. So the recommendation is that you do it with love, do it with serenity, with sincerity. For me, I think that, can you hear me okay? Uh, for me, I think that it's more about relativity. Uh, not, not, not saying that, uh, you know, I just think for me, uh, one of the, you know, my, my journey, my experience has benefited me to uh, be able to say to other individuals, like, I know exactly where you're at, I know exactly what you're going through, and, uh, and listen, it's okay. Uh, you know, letting people know that it's okay to feel that way, but uh, it, it, it's also very important that you, you get the help that you Need because your life's worth it, and uh, you know I couldn't, I, I didn't feel a sense of worth at the end of my journey, and uh, you know to reassure people that their their life is worth it, and uh, you know getting the help that you need is important so that you can give back and do all the things you ever dreamed of. Uh, you know I think that's that's pretty much the only approach that I've I've ever utilized or maintained is just more relativity. I know where you're at, and, and I, I know that your life's worth getting the help that you need. Thank you. Sure. Um, one of my favorite sayings is people aren't coming into treatment and looking for help because they saw the light. Usually it's, they felt the heat. And a lot of what Jack Whelan talked about earlier about uh, second chance and drug courts and some of the, the uh, programs that have been instituted in this county and across the country are providing an opportunity for someone to go to jail or go to treatment. Actually, some people do pick that. District Attorney Whalen, uh, this, I think this question is to you. Will you have you prosecuted any doctors or drug companies in regard to prescribing medications or in manufacturing of medications? In regard to drug companies, typically it would be the uh, Attorney General's office at the state level or the U.S. Attorney's Office on the federal level that would handle those type of investigations and prosecutions because they're nationally, um, they have national jurisdiction or statewide jurisdiction. However, when it comes to doctors, unfortunately, I'm sad to report that we've prosecuted a number of doctors so far that are pill mill doctors. Uh, the last one being a doctor in media who received a state sentence of 10 to 20 years for illegal, for 
prescriptions and, sent, and, and writing scripts uh, that were detrimental to many of the patients that were coming into the office. And in many of these cases, when we do investigate them, we send in undercover detectives that pose as patients and to see how easy it is to be able to get a, a prescription and whether they can get one just by paying money without having to relate any type of symptoms, any type of injury. And many of the doctors will not even take a medical history from the patient. Many of them have to be referred from other patients where the doctor has to build a comfort level with them in order to illegally prescribe to them. But some doctors have gotten rich off of these types of transactions. And we've been pretty aggressive considering when you look at the whole state of Pennsylvania, we've had a number of prosecutions focusing on doctors in Delaware County, but it's not an easy prosecution. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, if you close up access to pills, aren't you just pushing all the addicts towards heroin? Well, that issue comes up, certainly, where we, we would um, shut down, for example, a doctor, um, and they're saying, well, where are these individuals that are addicted to ox Oxycontin or Percocet or Vicodin, where are they going to get their drugs? And, and that is a concern, certainly. However, you have to be able to shut down the pill mills and address the situation so that more people don't become victimized. You also need to address, from the treatment and recovery standpoint, those patients that are addicted. But if you didn't do anything, you'd be, uh, it would be a catch-22. You'd never be able to address the situation. So we have to start and address the situation of trying to get people not to be addicted to pills, not to be addicted, obviously, that would lead not to be addicted to heroin. Uh, because of that direct correlation that we talked about all afternoon. We're also in, in a moment in time in history. So, you know, you, you might put some people in discomfort because they're not able to take their medication. Some people might turn to street drugs. And that's happening when somebody's going to a doctor and they start to um, abuse their medication. The doctor The next is kind of a, a theme uh, of a number of questions, so it's kind of a multi-part question. Number one, can you and or how do you get Narcan in your home? And then is there Narcan training in Delaware County for the public? Yes, um, you can get it in your home. You can purchase it. I believe um, all Acme supermarkets uh, carry it. You can walk in and purchase it. Many CVS uh, drugstores carry it. There is a standing uh, prescription that has been signed by the uh, Physician General in the state of Pennsylvania. And so I think it's easy to get. In regard to the training, of course, uh, there was some reference uh, made, I think, by Councilman White. When the police first 
were giving naloxone. It was a three-part um, apparatus. You had to assemble it right before you sprayed it in someone's nose. And then we were able to partner with Adapt Pharma out of Radnor, just coincidentally the only manufacturer uh, of this drug in the world. We were able to, they're from Radnor, Delaware County, so we were able to partner with them and purchase the, what the police are currently using, which we call nasal Narcan. And nasal Narcan does not have to be assembled. It looks like a little afrin that you would spray up your nose, and the police can just spray it up your nose. And now we would recommend that if you want to keep this in your house or in your car, that you uh, use the nasal Narcan because it's, it's much easier to handle. Uh, I think what law enforcement is paying for it is uh, two doses for $75. I think that it's higher if you walk into Acme to purchase it. So uh, it may be uh, over a hundred dollars if, if you walk into the supermarket and buy it. The next question really asks to talk about mental health treatment court. We do. We actually have three treatment courts in Delaware County. We have mental health treatment court, uh, which uh, is presided over by Judge Cobb and Mary Mann in our office uh, handles uh, that particular court. We have veterans treatment court, that Mary Mann also handles, but uh, a couple different judges preside over veterans treatment court. And we also have drug treatment court, uh, which is very successful. All the treatment courts are very successful. Drug treatment court is very successful when, when the group graduates, and there's probably more people in drug treatment court than any of the other specialty courts. And when they graduate, we have a success rate um, of 80%. 80% of those people that graduate uh, will have a job, will not be using drugs anymore, will be leading productive lives, and will not um, be recidivists. Mental health treatment court, sometimes they end up in mental health treatment court, even though they could be drug addicted, uh, because of the co-occurring disorders, uh, they may end up there because they have a specialty need on the mental health end and need to be monitored from a mental health perspective, not necessarily from a drug perspective, so they may, may end up there. Or you may have somebody in mental health treatment court that has nothing to do uh, with addiction. Uh, they just have some serious mental health concerns, and the whole purpose of that mental health treatment court is to get that person, just like drug treatment court, the treatment that they need in order to uh, get back on track and to be productive citizens and not engage in criminal activity. Um, but a lot of people cross over and are having problems with both drugs, alcohol, and mental health. With Pyramid closing, where can people send youth for inpatient and detox? With pyramid closing. So, so I recently, uh, just because I work in the field, I get called all the time for uh, helping uh, people get into treatment and start their journey. Uh, pyramid closing has kind of put a, an effect on the adolescent community from an inpatient standpoint. Uh, uh, in fact, I think we. You you still you still work with it? No. Okay. All right. My, my apologies, but um, I, I had a great experience. She works for us. <laughs> good. Hey, good stuff. That's awesome. Um, but I had a great experience with an adolescent facility that is outside of the state uh, with a gentleman who showed up with Sprinkle Cares night and his son was struggling at Springfield High School and, uh, and they're doing a fantastic job. So uh, although we, we don't have the amount of adolescent facilities, uh, the only adult facilities we need around here, uh, there are some great resources and uh, I'll leave my number here. What is being done to help uh, families dealing with drug addiction? What types of programming and what resources are available to them? So I personally know of a great uh, program that's being run out in Auburn right now, uh, a new facility called Center for Families just opened up in Auburn, Pennsylvania. Um, I know it's outside of the county, but uh, they run a free parent support program on Monday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, I believe that it's still sponsored by Cameron Foundation. Bill and his wife Pam uh, run that on Monday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's, I'm sure I'll put the question back on you. Your family, why that hurts for your families? Yeah, it grows, we continue to try to engage the family. Um, 
Again, I'll leave mine on the line if people want to do it, because I'll be happy to provide uh, The next was, it sounds like Delaware County has taken a lot of initiatives and shown to be a pioneer in fighting the opioid epidemic. I think we all would agree with that from what we've heard today and what we've seen. Has any information been shared with the county regarding the innocent victims, the infants born with neonatal abstinence syndrome? Yes, for a, a while on the heroin task force, one of the, um, the head of the doctor at Crozier um, Chester Medical Center was on the task force and he was addressing some of the issues with the infants that are born addicted to heroin. So Crozier does have that program going on and, and they're dealing with it. I'll, I'll defer to Dave may know more about it, but I do remember, I forget the doctor's name off the top of my head, he was there for a number of meetings at the beginning of the task force not been to many meetings uh, in the last two years, but we still send him information. And I, Dr. Abedian, of course, may contact him periodically as part of the medical subcommittee. And that's part of the task force. So we do have, we do reach out and we do have concerns over people that are addicted when they have babies that are born addicted. So we, we have, we have three We have the um, pediatric unit that does treat neonatal action syndrome, treating the mother and the baby that's born with the addiction. We have the Center of Excellence and AS program. Ladies, would you like to raise your hand? Uh, and greater people that are on that team are here today. Um, that's a new program up and running. And we also have the support in our outpatient services under our methadone license. What would you tell someone who has attempted recovery and was not successful? What would your words be to them? An attempt at recovery and was not successful? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, I just feel like it's a process, right? Everybody's, everybody's journey uh, into recovery is a process. Mine was, mine was a process. I was not the first time there, like I mentioned. And what I had to really look at when I came back in, uh, last time I came back in was uh, what I was doing. And I had to take a deep look at myself. And, uh, but I can't do that by myself. I have to be I have to become accountable to somebody else in the program. So I had to get a sponsor and I had to really get down to causes and conditions and do the work. And uh, that's what I would tell anybody who maybe has had a failed attempt at recovery. Uh, is I don't believe it's uh, the, the message being spread. I believe it, 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 you have to take an internal look at self. I heard some and I don't know that these are statistics, but basically with any medical treatment, 30% of people come in, they get a recommendation by the medical professional, they follow that recommendation, they live their life uh, pretty much simply free. 30% come in, they follow the direction to some extent, and they relax and suffer a couple times and then get it. And 30% suffer from and suffer those consequences, including death. Um, anyone who's struggling, continue to struggle, it, it's real, it's not, this is an addiction. It was, like, that whole thing when Nancy Reagan saying, just say no, I, I don't know that that, that ever worked for anybody. Like that. <laughs> just, and then they hear stories about what she was doing, but I won't go into that. Just say no is a nice idea. It, it's not going to happen when you have an addiction, especially with some, you know, it's, it's profound and strong as our own. Um, and we do, I said earlier, we underplay alcohol. Like, you cannot die from withdrawal of heroin. You will die or you could die from the withdrawal of alcohol. Alcohol is as lethal, if not more lethal. 
picture like zero with a minus 90 and a plus 90, zero is not used, and that is not recovery. That's absent. Recovery happens when you start to work on yourself. And in the language of being clean is you clean something. <coughs> if you stop using, you're not clean. Now, there, there, there are protocols in treatment. There are protocols in the 12-step programs where people look in the mirror and they do an evaluation and take an inventory and make changes in, in their thinking and their behavior. Um, and in, in a sense, it's value clarification. So um, people that are struggling with this thing, they, they need to find the hope. And everybody talks about the bottoms. Um, I think the bottoms just bring people to hope. You need to deliver a bomb and deliver a bomb, you know, as nicely or however you have to deliver. But um, that hope is the answer, and that hope is where you find the solution, and the solution's out there. We talk about treatment and, and recovery and 12 steps. That's the predominant place that you'll find the numbers, and the research says that, you know, this percentage of people are getting treated and getting help. There, there are people that have since the beginning of time that have stopped on their own, that have found religion, that have found things. Um, I speak of the medical model. I speak of the uh, recovery-based, 12-step-based 12 12 -based recovery process. And it's a process. Um, relapse happens. It happens with all medical conditions. It, it happens with addictions. It doesn't have to, but it does. And for anybody who's struggling, you come back. Day, and that's what they say in the rooms. But, you know, like the guy told me, I'm going to learn how to stop drinking in the bar. I'm going to find out how to stop drinking and treatment in the rooms of alcohol times or narcotics. And from the criminal justice perspective, you have, as Councilman White talked about, second chance court, which is geared toward individuals that have not been able to deal with their addiction issue or end up in the criminal justice system and to try to get them help as soon as they enter the criminal justice system, as David pointed out, sometimes it takes a year before a case works its way through from the time of arrest to the time that the judge sentences that person. The judges and, and our office, as well as county council, got together to create second chance court so that the addict would receive treatment as soon as he comes into the criminal justice system at the arrest level and when he appears before the district justice. So that's important. Also, I mentioned drug treatment court. The drug treatment court is set up where Judge Hazel presides over it. He's like a father figure. Many of these individuals test positive while they're being uh, placed in drug treatment court. They, they, they fail. They, they end up uh, uh, committing infractions. And what they do is they try to work with that person, get them back on track. Because it's a two-year program, and in order to successfully complete drug treatment court, you're in the process for two years, so there's a lot of tolerance before you would fail out of drug treatment court, and I believe that's why the success rate is so significant, because of the second chances they give you, because of how they work with you on a weekly, if not daily basis. How and why is heroin such a cheap and available drug? It's all driven by market conditions. Unfortunately, it's, most of it's coming into this country through um, South America. Uh, unfortunately, we live in an area where it's easily accessible. This whole area, the whole Philadelphia region, actually from New York, from Boston, New York, all the way down uh, through the, the, the East Coast. It's easy to come up the river. It's easy to ship in through planes, trains. We have this highway system. We have the uh, mass uh, transit systems where people can get drugs in easily. Right down in Eddystone is pen terminals where they're constantly unloading ships and cargo ships and they have them coming in from Philadelphia. Now there are inspections, there's drug dogs in these different places, but it's, it's infiltrating the area. And because there's, there's a will to get it in here because of the money that's being made now, it's, it's cheap uh, because there's so much of it in the marketplace so it'll be affected by market conditions. If, if for some reason the supply was to diminish, the, the price would obviously go up, but they were able to get so much of it in. Now the DEA, we work with them uh, on, on many issues. They're a 
aggressively trying to prevent drugs from coming into this country, uh, and, and they continue to work on that, but uh, the, it's a lot cheaper than pills because pills are being controlled through the Federal Drug Administration, and generally speaking, uh, a 25 milligram pill of uh, Oxycontin is gonna sell for $25, um, and uh, a little packet of heroin you would get even according to the addicts, the better high would be $5. So there's a big discrepancy with the sale on the street uh, when we deal with it from a uh, drug enforcement perspective. Yeah, I'll just mention, like, uh, you know, nobody, uh, my point earlier, nobody wants to end up doing heroin, right? Uh, but it becomes a financial decision at one point in time. You know, I mean, clothes get so expensive that, like, to, to, to your point, the heroin is so cheap. Get what I need to get on a daily basis. I need to do what I need to do, and uh, that's that's the that's the sad. <laughs> so one of the things why it's so readily available is there's a market for it, and, and like the drugs are the answer. What's the question? What's going on with our young people? What's going on in our society that, <clears throat> that heroin and drugs are the answer? Um, the flooding of the market in the '90s, the cocaine cartels did. International research of their uh, their market, and they came up with that the United States was the best um, market that you could buy cocaine on any street corner in any place in America, and that they should diversify and go into the future. As you can see, they did. Um, there's a heroin called China White that comes out of China, and then there's the synthetic uh, fentanyl. So we're getting, and, and then there's the pharmaceutical um, branding and market. Um, so we're getting flooded from a number of different variables uh, from having heroin and narcotics on, on the street and available to every age group. But we got to go back to which, why is the market created? What's happening? You know, you can blame the economy, you can blame this. But we live in an instant gratification, fast food um, culture, and, and everybody wants an instant answer to an addiction that came from instant gratification. And it's not an easy answer, and it's a difficult problem. It's going to it's going to require everybody to get involved. In. And then the last question is: What does? Uh What's the biggest hurdle that each one of you see uh, with, with dealing with this epidemic? Well, I, I think it, it, I, what we're seeing, it's very disappointing, it's discouraging to the extent that I see the numbers increasing. When the Heroin Task Force was started in 2012, we really believed that we were gonna see the numbers being driven down. And it's been just the opposite. The numbers are increasing uh, the police, as, as Dave made reference to, Dave White, um, we're almost at 700 uh, saves of, uh, with nasal Narcan, which is very concerning because those people could have died. Our, our death rate is increasing. Um, even though we have all these saves, our death rate is still increasing. So very disturbing, very discouraging. However, with that said, I believe with all of our efforts, with the educational, with the recovery and the treatment, with the community efforts, with people coming together, with more people understanding uh, how people become addicted uh, and, and working together to overcome, I believe that we should see the numbers start to be reversed and those numbers coming down. I just didn't expect it uh, to, to go up over the last couple of years and become even worse than we had anticipated. When we saw the issue, we thought it was a concern, but we had no idea at the time it was as bad as it was, and then it just seemed to take off. And we're just lucky here in Delaware County. I know we have some law enforcement here with us today, but the law enforcement, we have the brave men and women that are out protecting our communities every day, did not have to carry naloxone. There was, there's some communities still in Pennsylvania where the police won't carry it because they don't see it as their role it's, it's the EMS worker's role, it's the paramedic's role,
That's who we'll call when someone should receive uh, nasal Narcan. But our police stood up and said, how can we help? How can we save somebody? How can we avoid this parent from burying their child? So I commend our law enforcement for just doing an incredible job on a daily basis protecting our streets and our homes. Uh, and then rising to this occasion where they saw an epidemic and they were willing when we approached them, they were willing to do this, they were willing to come onto the scene and try to save somebody's life. life. And in this particular instance, have almost saved 700 people. So, you know, God bless our police and, and, and our emergency responders. And, I, and, and I'm, I think we're all uh, very lucky to live in Delaware County and to, to, to be, um, to have uh, the, the proactive approach that our district attorney has taken. Um, but I think that the biggest hurdle uh, that, that a lot of people don't talk about is uh, making sure that Big Farm is held accountable uh, for flooding the market in 1995, for putting these prescription drugs on the market in 1998, furthermore, uh, for, for causing the damage that they've caused. And I know that a lot of people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that out loud, but the fact of the matter is, is that we had this issue with, with big tobacco, and uh, we made them uh, be held accountable to uh, put funds aside to uh, pay for the damage that they've done through education and information to the school system. I do not know why, and uh, it will become one of my lifelong missions is to uh, understand how we can hold Big Pharma accountable to make sure that they pay for the epidemic that they have created over this long period of time. Uh, and, and I just think that it's an issue that uh, gets kind of missed, and, and, and I, you know, I ask myself why, and I've continued to do research uh, as well. I think the biggest uh, obstacle that I
But two, two states, uh, people have filed lawsuits against the pharmaceuticals for um, you know, uh, drug-related problems. Yes. Um, and, and before I, I miss the opportunity, um, Jack Brown has done a lot of things we spoke about, a lot of things today. Um, one thing we haven't spoke about today, and, and, what, and, and that is the um, crisis intervention training that the police this is something that's provided through the Office of Behavioral Health. And that is that every police officer is offered um, the ability to go through a 40 hour training to learn about addiction, mental illness, the services that are offered, intellectual disabilities. You offer a 40 hour training uh, twice a year, and, and people in the field are volunteering their time. Police officers are coming to this treatment or to, 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 to this program. And they're sitting through 40 hours for a class to add another set of tools to the toolbox. And, and again, that all the police that I've talked to over the years and the emails we get, they're grateful to have it. And these are the men and women that are the front lines of our society, and they're looking for tools. And they're open to changes and offering help to people. So I, I, I think the biggest obstacle across the board is is education, communication, and the, this uh, crisis intervention training that is being offered by the, the police has been well received and been a big part of changing our culture. Can I just add one last thing to that, too? Um, I think Dave mentioned uh, a very, very valid point as far as authorizations and providing people with the treatment that they need. Uh, you know, the 30 day model, I, I hate to say it doesn't work. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're giving people 30 days to get their lives back together and throwing them out the street and expecting them to uh, bounce back their way and figure out how to do this thing. Uh, we, we need longer term treatment. Uh, we wouldn't treat a cancer patient that way. Uh, why would we treat somebody who is afflicted with this disease that way? Um, and, and, and that's going to be a process that's going to that's going to happen over time. And, 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 and to that point too, it's, it's important that every member in this community who uh, you know, really cares about this gets involved with those legislators and lets them know what's important to them. Uh, it's something that I've learned over the past three years of working with YPR because we are a grassroots advocacy program that is set up to really work with legislation on the local level. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to finish with is it's really important that we talk about these issues because stigma kills people. Stigma prevents people from asking for help each and every day. And, uh, and if we don't talk about these issues and we don't approach uh, people that are afflicted with this disease with compassion, people will die. And, and people do die because of that. I know for me, my journey was probably extended six years longer than it needed to because I was terrified to ask for help. And I was terrified to be labeled as an addict or an alcoholic. But the fact of the matter today is that recovery is a beautiful journey. And you have to let more people know that you do recover, you can recover, and you can become a very important part of society and, and become an important part of your families uh, and loved ones. So uh, let's help the boss that stigma by talking about uh, <coughs> in a more compassionate way is, is the only ask I would say. Everyone, if we could thank these folks for just a <laughs>